Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. We start with question number one from Tavish Scott. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many eligible farmers and crofters have received a letter explaining their entitlements under the 2015 Basic Payment Scheme. Minister Hamza Youssef. Uh, 16,162 confirmation of entitlement letters have been issued to eligible farmers and crofters explaining their entitlements under the 2015 Basic Payment Scheme. Officials are continuing to work hard to resolve outstanding issues and there's a clear uh, need to focus on providing farmers and crofters with the information Minister, they require. Minister, would you, would you mind just pausing a second? I think that the speakers are turned off. The microphones are on, but... Just hold on one second. That's it's good because it was the wrong answer. That's better. It's good because it was the wrong answer. Right. Uh, Sorry, Minister, if we can take... Oh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great answer as well the first time, uh, President <laughs> Officer, but I'll try again. Uh, 14,162 confirmations of entitlement letters have been issued to eligible farmers and crofters explaining their entitlement under the 2015 basic uh, payment scheme. Officials are continuing to work hard to resolve some of the outstanding issues that we know about, uh, and there is a clear focus on providing farmers and crofters with the appropriate information they need to understand what payments they've received. We're rightly prioritised in getting money into people's uh, accounts and maximising the funds uh, we can access from Europe before the 15th of October deadline. Tavis Scott. Thank you. I thought the first answer was much better than the second one. But the, um, uh, uh, and I'd also like to uh, uh, commiserate with the minister whose portfolio seems to expand in front of our eyes every, uh, every day. And it's absolutely not his fault, not his fault, that the government have, uh, cannot yet confirm that the £180 million pounds that has been spent on the IT computer system for farmers and crosses across Scotland uh, uh, is going to work in 2017. But in that light, would he be able to say to Parliament uh, when the entitlement letters that have just gone out for the previous year will go out during 2017 uh, and would he also be able to confirm that the appeal mechanism which is very important for crofters and farmers who may disagree with the uh, with uh, what they have been uh, allocated uh, is still open to crofters and farmers uh, and that will remain the case during 2017. Minister. Yes let me try to give him some of the assurances uh, he requires and thank him for his commiseration which is very kind of him to do so but uh, I think the serious point that we have to make on this is that clearly the government uh, has learnt lessons. Uh, clearly, uh, Fergus Shewing and the Cabinet Secretary has been working hard uh, with officials, but also those in, in the IT side of things to ensure that we learn lessons uh, from 2016. For example, you know, putting ourselves onto a better footing by uh, hiring uh, more staff uh, in, in, in RPID area offices. Uh, in terms of the IT system itself, I know the Cabinet Secretary had a discussion this morning uh, with those in charge of the, the IT system to seek their assurances uh, for 2016. And, and we've learnt lessons from the first year of the new CAP regime cap regime which will help our 2016 processes um, so as well as the IT assurances that we've received um, I can of course give the assurance that the final processing of applications for payments uh, will be undertaken and we expect and anticipate that 2016 payments will be made uh, and substantially completed between then and, uh, and the end of the payment uh, period um, and, and the cabinet secretary has offered to update parliament on progress in January in terms of the appeals process uh, absolutely I can give them that uh, the assurance that uh, no farmer or crofter uh, should be disadvantaged by uh, the outstanding uh, entitlement letters that they're due to receive uh, and that the appeals mechanism and the review mechanism uh, is, is still in, in, uh, absolutely in place. Peter Chapman. Officer, we all know the symbolic way that this government has handled the delivery of CAP payments. It has been a disaster for rural communities. It has been a complete disaster for rural communities. Even now, just this morning, in fact, a constituent, constituent contacted me saying he has yet to be given a full breakdown of his payments. Does, does the minister understand the huge frustration and the difficulties that these, these, these problems are, are causing to farmers and producers and crofters? Minister. I think he should know, and, and I think the member will, if he's being fair, uh, understand that the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing, uh, knows, and we all in the government know, that of course things uh, could have been and should have been done better, and regret and apologise uh, for it to any farmer and crofter who has been disadvantaged by those uh, mistakes that were made. Uh, what we are doing, what the Cabinet Secretary has been tirelessly doing, uh, is to ensure that farmers are not disadvantaged when new payments come in. So we know about the early uh, loan scheme uh, that has been uh, hugely well received uh, in, in November. Uh, we know about the assurances now that I've given in terms of the IT system. And I suggest to Mr Chapman, instead of carping from the sidelines, be part of the solution 
uh, if, he, if he wants. Come, of course, rightly question ministers, quite, quite rightly question the government and what can be done. But I think farmers and crofters, even in the area that he represents, will want him to work with the government to try to find solutions so that farmers and crofters aren't disadvantaged. And as I said, the Cabinet Secretary will provide regular updates uh, and have promised to uh, update Parliament uh, early in the new year. Question two has not been lodged. Question three, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding Scotland's role in supporting refugees entering the UK. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Presiding Officer, Scottish Government officials are in regular dialogue with Home Office officials about support for refugees who settle in Scotland. Ministers have also discussed the issue and I discussed the resettlement of refugees and unaccompanied children, <laughs> among other issues, when I met the Immigration Minister in October. And I'm very proud that Scotland has now welcomed around uh, 1,250 Syrian refugees uh, under the Syrian Resettlement Programme since October 2015. Rona Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I welcome the fact that Eastern Barnetshire Council have at long last agreed to take refugees, four families and four unaccompanied children. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that in addition to housing and education, it's essential that a welcoming committee from their communities help integrate the families socially to help with language and local knowledge issues? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, um, like the member, I also welcome Eastern Barnetshire Council's decision to participate uh, in the resettlement programme. And by 2017, I'm pleased to say that all local authorities uh, across Scotland will be involved in supporting uh, refugees settle in Scotland. It has to be acknowledged that there is considerable preparatory work that needs to be done by local authorities before refugees uh, arrive in their communities. For example, to ensure the right accommodation services and supports are in place. I know that there is a wealth of expertise in COSLA, other local authorities and third sector organisations that Eastern Barnetshire Council are drawing on eh, as they prepare eh, to welcome refugees. And many councils have also engaged closely eh, with their local communities, either through volunteering programmes or other means, eh, to make best use of that enormous eh, goodwill that is out there eh, to provide eh, befriending eh, and other support, whether it's English language practice eh, and other ways eh, to welcome welcome refugees uh, into our communities and I'm pleased to uh, acknowledge that Ms Mackay uh, is working very closely with Twecker Health and Living Centre uh, to arrange a community team uh, to help with that uh, integration, integration from day one and to give a very warm welcome uh, to refugees when they arrive in Eastern Berkshire. Question number four, Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assurances it can give to customers who signed Solar Energy Green Deal agreements with Home Energy and Lifestyle Management Systems, which ceased trading in April 2016, in light of the reports that some have found their energy bills increasing by up to three times and the value of their homes being adversely affected. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. President Officer, I'm very sorry to hear that customers who signed up to the UK Government's Green Deal scheme in good faith uh, are facing difficulties from a scheme that was meant to help households uh, to reduce their energy bills. Unfortunately, it's not the first time that we've heard of customers facing difficulties under this scheme and we've raised our concerns directly with the UK Government. And we've also worked with the relevant regulatory bodies to ensure that redress routes through both the Green Deal and the Financial Ombudsman are available to anyone uh, in this uh, circumstance. And I would urge uh, anyone concerned who think they have been affected by this scheme or who are struggling to pay their energy bills to contact Home Energy Scotland, who can provide support on this matter. Rona, sorry, Ivan Baker, Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer, um, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Dozens of my constituents in Blantyre have approached me to complain that they have been missold solar panels by Home Energy and Lifestyle Management Systems Limited relating to the UK Government's Green Deal programme. This is having a huge impact on them financially and personally as they deal with the distress this is causing them. And I believe this issue is not confined to my constituency of Rutherglen. Can the Cabinet Secretary give my constituents reassurance the Scottish Government will press the UK Government for a resolution to the mis-selling of solar panel deals in Scotland, which have left people with huge debt for years to come and properties which they are unable to sell? Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, sir, I know Ms Hockey has been working very hard on this issue within her constituency, both representing uh, her uh, specific constituents, but also uh, raising uh, the matter uh, over the piece. 
Um, can I reassure her by saying that the Scottish Government have made a number of requests over the past few years uh, for the UK <coughs> Government to strengthen their consumer protection processes. The previous Minister for Housing wrote to the then Secretary of State Amber Rudd at the end of last year emphasising the need to ensure that their schemes offer protection to Scottish customers and we will continue to press them uh, to take action uh, wherever uh, possible. But given the significant issues raised in connection to Helms, uh, Scottish Government officials convened with ministerial approval a UK-wide uh, enforcement group in December 2015. Uh, this group comprised, amongst others, from the representatives from the Green Deal, the Financial Ombudsman, uh, Energy Savings Trust, Citizens Advice Scotland, uh, Trade and Standards, uh, and indeed uh, the UK Government. Uh, and this meeting was used to highlight issues Scottish consumers are facing. Uh, through this process, we have facilitated, I'm pleased to say, and agreed redress routes uh, through the Ombudsman uh, for customers who feel that they have been missold plans uh, under this scheme. Uh, and I also want to highlight, President Officer, that the, the Scottish Government fund uh, Home Energy Scotland, this is an advice service which is also on hand uh, to support and guide consumers on this matter. And I will ask uh, my officials to liaise directly with Ms Hockey to help her constituents uh, access this support if they have not already done so. Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I would just like to draw the Cabinet Secretary's attention to the fact that Helms were also involved in insulating homes in Glasgow Province under the Green Deal. My constituents have been left without building warrants and with work of an unknown quality that means many cannot get insurance or claim the cash back. They are thousands of pounds out of pocket and need remedial work. Given that they went ahead confident this company appeared on the list of approved installers authorised by the UK Department of Energy and Climate Change, what can the Scottish Government do to support these constituents and to get the UK Government to take some responsibility here? Cabinet Secretary. President officer, we are aware that around five customers received external wall insulation from this company, which was partly funded through the early phases uh, of the Scottish Government cashback scheme and have been left with the work uh, which is not up to standard and for which they have no building warrant. Uh, I understand that Mr McKee's office has been in correspondence with the Energy Savings Trust uh, about his constituents. Um, if I can also say to Mr McKee that we have instructed Energy Savings Trust to support these customers, uh, to liaise with manufacturers of the external wall insulation system, uh, to establish what remedial works can be carried out uh, under the guarantee and establish what is required in order for the customer to get a building warrant uh, from their council. Uh, we anticipate that we will have paid out all outstanding claims from householders uh, through this scheme shortly, and I can confirm that we will do uh, what we can to help these householders resolve this situation. And if Mr McKee is aware of any more constituents uh, in this situation, I uh, will ask that his office continue to pass their details uh, to the Energy Savings Trust. Question number five, Maurice Corrie. <coughs> Presiding officer, thank you. Um, to ask the Scottish Government how it will ensure the continued viability of rural care homes. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. It's for health and social care partnerships to determine the need for care home places in their localities and to work with others, including providers, to meet that need. The Scottish Government will continue to work with NHS boards, local authorities and other stakeholders to drive up quality in the community and ensure appropriate social care provision is available. The formula used in the distribution of the Scottish Government's funding to local authorities takes into account a number of needs-based factors, including rurality and the additional cost of providing services to island communities. And of course, we've provided a further £250 million in the 2016-17 budget to support partnerships to protect and grow social care services. Maurice Corey. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her reply. For a care home to be financially viable under the National Care Home Contract, it needs to have at least 60 beds. In many rural areas, care homes are of, that, of that size are not possible and are coming under threat of closure, and I, have, I know a few in my area that are in that position. Does the Minister agree that with the rising age of the nation, that keeping open rural care homes is vital to ensuring that the elderly who need that support are able to stay as close to their homes and local communities as possible? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I am aware, of course, of the concerns uh, over uh, particular care homes, Auchinley and Craigard, and their potential closures. Uh, our Gail and Butte Health and Social Care Partnership are working very closely with the care inspectorate, providers, residents and relatives to ensure that where closure is unavoidable, the disruption to residents are 
implemented with minimal impact. Uh, specifically regarding Auchin Lee, uh, I am aware that, that Mike Russell uh, has been meeting with the uh, care home owners and I think a, another meeting is arranged for the 19th of December with representatives of the Relatives Action Group and a staff representative. I think it's really important that where solutions can be found that of course we would want to support that. Uh, I think um, Morris uh, Corey makes a, an important point but he also should recognise that actually the many, many people, more people are now being cared for at home and uh, avoiding the need to uh, go into a care home, which of course is different from 10, uh, 15, 20 years ago. But uh, if Morris Corey would find it helpful, I would be uh, happy to write to him with more details around those local issues. Question number six, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it can take to ensure that water meters on farms are placed in accessible locations. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Klein. Um, it is important that water meters are placed in locations that ensure that the volume of water consumed by a customer is recorded accurately. Whilst the accessibility of the location is important, the location will need to reflect other constraints, such as the layout of the existing pipework and the connections to other properties. In general, meters are located externally at the boundary of a premises. Um, Scottish Water's Meter Code of Practice, published in 2013, provides guidance on the preferred location of meters. Emma Harper. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Recently, a local farmer in Dumfrieshire told me that meters had been placed in inaccessible places, making it difficult to take a reading. Is it possible to relay to Scottish Water the importance of metres being positioned in accessible locations or repositioned if necessary? Well, metres can indeed be relocated with the agreement of Scottish Water. Um, I've indicated in my first answer what some of the other constraints are in connection with that, uh, with that work. I understand that Business Stream has already arranged a meeting with NFUS on the 22nd of December to discuss this and other issues and that both Scottish Water and Business Stream have contact, they contacted uh, the member's own office to also discuss. Um, as I've already explained, any alterations will be constrained by the configuration of the existing pipework and connections, but I do hope the member takes up the offer of meetings. Question number seven, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that pupils with disorders on the autism spectrum have equal opportunities in school. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Officer, we want all children and young people to get the support they need to reach their full learning potential. Local authorities have duties under the Education Additional Support for Learning Scotland Act 2004 as amended to identify, provide for and review personalised support for children and young people who face barriers to learning, including those arising from autism. Dean Lockhart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Recent statistics from Naval Scotland highlight that more than half of children with learning difficulties and or autism believe they are not fulfilling their potential at school. Just this week, statistics show that the number of special school teachers have dropped by 9% since uh, 2007. Does the Government agree that this represents a concerning position for these children and that more must be done to provide more funding and more support for pupils with additional support needs? Cabinet Secretary. President officer, I had the, uh, the very good fortune to meet with Enable Scotland when they were in Parliament highlighting many of these issues uh, just last week and it was a very helpful and informative discussion and the central point of the proposals put forward by Enable Scotland was to ensure that we used every opportunity to ensure that the statutory guidance and statutory framework that is in place is used to meet the needs of young people within uh, the school situation. Now in relation to the comparison with 2007, of course, what we have seen since 2007 has been um, a, a growing sense that young people should be educated within a mainstream environment. Um, we, that follows from the 2000 uh, Standards in Scotland School Bill. And what we need to make sure is that our education system is fulfilling the needs of young people. And in some circumstances, that will be the case within the mainstream setting. In other cases, that will be in a special educational setting. And we must make those judgments according to the needs of young people themselves. Ross Greer. Thank you. With the loss of over 400 additional support needs teachers since 2009, how many more teachers does the government expect local authorities will be forced to cut as a result of today's budget announcements? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I would point out to Mr Greer, of course, that teacher numbers on Tuesday increased. 
uh, and they increased because the government made it an absolute commitment to make sure that that was the case. And I welcome the fact that teacher numbers increased on Tuesday. Obviously, um, it, Mr Mackay will set out in just a couple of hours' time uh, the government's budget, and I look forward to hearing uh, the measures that he sets out this afternoon and the impact they'll have positively on Scottish education yeah, and yeah. other public services.